What do you think? Okay, you had a story about this. Well, I, I was I was thinking back a uh, moment, uh, reflecting on the Gleason show, and suddenly an image came to mind. Uh, as I said, he didn't memorize uh, until the day of the show, and there were no cue cards, and teleprompter didn't exist in that time. And this was um, the Schick Company, who made a razor, wanted him to do a, a commercial uh, for them. And, of course, he memorized it. And when he got in the air, he had a Schick razor in his hand. It was white, on, and, and the name was embossed in white. And he blocked out the name of the Schick Company. And the commercial was done ex without ever mentioning the name. And you've got to remember at this time also that Gleason was one of the most powerful personalities on television and uh, was literally a king. So now he's holding this up, and it's Christmas time, and he's saying, okay, kids, here's the, diff the gift you want to get your dad. Go in and ask for a... A razor just like this one. Be sure to say, I want this razor. Don't forget to name this razor. Uh, yes, step up and buy a razor just like this. And I go off and never mention Schick. I'm standing next to two of the advertising agency representatives of the Schick company. And one guy turns to the other and says, what do you think? Uh, should we go backstage and, and talk to him? The other guy said, I don't know. He got most of it right. They were, uh, you know, too intimidated to uh, uh, seek uh, 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 the king, seek out the king. Um, ironically, another thought just occurred. Art and Audrey, I believe, were nominated and won three Emmys each. Jackie not only didn't win an Emmy, he never received the nomination. It's a phenomena or a phenomenon that is hard to uh, uh, explain or justify. Um, well, if you give me a word, we'll ask 10 people and call and see if their uh, opinions uh, help us. So, uh, Jackie Gleason, did you... Can you describe him, the man, personally? Yes, he's a paradox. Uh, uh, I think he catered to the illusion that he was a bon vivant and, and out on the town and, and drinking heavily. Matter of fact, I, I, I don't know if Jackie actually drank heavily or one drink got him uh, to be one drunk. Um, but as he got older... Uh, he became increasingly withdrawn. He was interested in the supernatural and the psychic. And he became a, a student of occult. And he was essentially a, a very profound man. Remember, I said that we had a um, abiding friendship. And I knew it was based more than our both being in uh, the comedy business. It was in how he perceived life. Although he was somewhat cynical, I found it was uh, essentially defensive. And uh, deep down, he was not the unkind person he was painted to be. As, when I mentioned earlier, I had mononucleosis, and I think there wasn't a week during the eight or nine weeks in which I was bedridden uh, that Jackie didn't come over two or three times. Uh, he might invent excuses why he was there. Uh, you know, being he was uncomfortable admitting to any um, uh, uh, being sentimental or, uh, or sensitive, uh, which is a prevalent condition today. We're filled with cynicism and we're embarrassed by uh, caring, loving, and uh, tenderness. And so um, that may have been part of his uh, uh, problem. Uh, he wanted a, an outlet for all these feelings and, and, and didn't have it. How would you describe his talents? Why was he so popular on TV? Uh, I think he was probably one of the best reactors 
that I've ever encountered, and I think this is true. Uh, other people who are experts at this uh, do agree. His skill was not in delivering a joke, but responding to events, moments, lines. As a matter of fact, very often we would go to him and say, Jackie, you don't have many punchlines. He said, do I have something to react to? And we'd say, yes. He said, okay, I'll take care of myself. And I think that was his skill. Remember those magnificent takes, those delayed reactions. Uh, nobody can make as many chins go as Jackie could, with possibly the exception of Charles Lawton. Um, uh, and I think he discovered that, and I may have been with him uh, when it happened. He was appearing on a bill as the comic, and on the act was a novelty, on the bill was a novelty act, uh, Chaz Chase. Chaz Chase came out uh, elegantly dressed, tuxedo, uh, uh, white tie, uh, tails actually, white tie, and cigarette. And he never spoke, but as he lit the cigarette, he ate it. Then he ate the collar of his shirt, everything. Uh, and he, the audience would be stupefied and, and finally burst into laughter. I, he was a very ad, adept at palming things, but you got the illusion he was eating his whole outfit and would be down to his shorts soon. Well, uh, Gleason decided uh, to st come on stage and react to Chaz Chase. And I, the act suddenly became twice as funny. Gleason representing the audience and responding to what was happening. And I think at that moment, Jackie realized he's not good at delivering jokes out of character. He's not essentially a monologist. He is a comic actor. And, and, and ultimately, he made that transition. He still tried to do monologue, but he himself knew, and that's why we had all those uh, disquieting moments at the opening of the variety show, trying to find jokes he could tell. Do you think he was uncomfortable being himself because he wasn't in character? Uh, I, I don't know if I can get that profound and, and psychological. I could say that about Sir Caesar. Uh, with Gleason, I just don't think he was a good story uh, teller. He was a spontaneous comedian. He came up uh, through the ranks of Jack White's club where they insulted people gratuitously, and his mind worked that way. Um, they pretended to be waiters, and they berated the customers. And, and again, he'd react to somebody's inadequacies or their pomposity or their absurd behavior, and that's where his skill uh, was most apparent. Uh, I think he had a lot of hang-ups, but uh, they certainly didn't manifest themselves on the stage. Can you tell me about some of the characters he played, and, and if you remember you know, some specific routines that you wrote? Uh, I probably won't do a great deal of justice uh, to the characters he played, but I did have a theory which became part of... Uh, uh, a biography of Gleason written by Bill Henry. Uh, it's a marvelous book called The Great One. And he, Henry was a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning novelist and he said to me that I had given him the idea of how to formulize the book. Uh, I had said that I felt the poor soul Reggie Van Gleason and Ralph Cramden were all facets of Jackie's personality, or they were beliefs he held but couldn't express other than comedically. A, the poor soul, good human being. You get taken advantage of if you're kind and uh, considerate. You're exploited. Uh, Reggie Van Gleeson, wealth, uh, indifference to humanity and all. The world is your oyster. Um, and Ralph Crandom is every man struggling against whatever system exists, always uh, trying to catch the next rainbow, and uh, hopelessness is always pervasive. So then the other characters were a further extension of the loudmouth Charlie Bratton, uh, the guy who again impervious to anything around him. He was going to get whatever he wanted. Uh, he'd succeed despite obvious uh, uh, inadequacies.
which he himself, uh, the character, would discount. Did so, you have a take on Joe the bartender? Uh, Joe the bartender, I think, was uh, uh, Jackie's attempt to uh, do st <laughs> those jokes which he couldn't do in a monologue in, in the character. And then it was his old neighbor. Everybody he spoke to in that bar actually existed. Um, that was fascinating. In fact, sometimes when we wrote a joke for bar the bartender, he'd say, uh, Denny won't say that. Um, uh, uh, Dennehy, Mr. Dennehy won't say that. And we said, well, we don't know Mr. Dennehy. And he was so accurate that the man who was always accident prone, one night I was going to a card game and that ma a man got in the elevator who was wearing a Band-Aid on his forehead. And he said to me, aren't you a Gleason writer? I said, yes. He introduced himself. He was that character who was, Gleason always described as uh, getting into one accident after another. So, a marvelous endorsement. So let's talk about a few of the uh, Honeymooners uh, shows that you wrote the, in the sketch form. The oh. first one that you mentioned, Letter to the Boss, did that air? Did you? Oh, yes. That was the fir first long form. That, that uh, had a, the kind of uh, story I like. Uh, uh, because uh, you can't foresee where it's going. Uh, he's irate that he didn't get a promotion. He came in and he assumed he was going to be the head. He decides to write a letter. And Norton says, no, you're filled with anger now. Wait. He gives him some very sound advice. And then Norton says, okay, uh, Ralph, you... Uh, he says, I don't have a good hand. He says, dictate it to me, Ralph. And I'll... Uh, you can sign it. Okay, and that's the first time we ever had this uh, with the hand routine. And... Gleason becoming infuriated. Okay, now they get ready. He says, you dirty bum. He said, wait a minute, Rolf. You can't start a salutation like that, you dirty bum. It's it, it got to be more gentle. You you know, get, get into it. Dear, you like that. He says, okay, dear, you dirty bum. And they uh, writes a scathing letter, and Norton, he signs it, and Norton uh, takes off to mail it on his way to the bowling game. And, of course, uh, uh, Jackie learns then that he's promoted. He got the promotion. Now the idea is to get that letter, and hopefully Norton hasn't mailed it. And, of course, uh, he goes to the bowling alley, and there's a scene, and then Norton did mail it. Now they're trying to get it out of the mailbox, which is a federal offense. So all the complications, being arrested, explaining it, then the only hope is to get to the office early in the morning, intercept the mail, and get it out of there. And he gets to the boss's office, and he gets in, and the boss came in early. So it has all the twists and turns. And then the editor, uh, the boss is congratulating for the motion, and says, you're going to have to deal with a lot of things I deal with. Uh, he said, again, do you have this mail as complaints? And then, of course, he, unre he reads uh, the letter. And once again, a, a good opportunity is gone. I've forgotten the uh, uh, whether Gleason signed it or Norton signed it for him, I can't remember. But they had a, tw a twist at the end. So you wrote the story for that, and then the uh, that's the story. Yeah, and then we all went. Would... Then we f uh, then all of us uh, went and wrote that together in, in concert. Yeah. Uh, there was another one called "Stand In for Murder." Oh yeah, well, "Stand In for Murder." We, again, we we're talking long form or what they call the lost honeymooners, the almost hour ones. That was such a complicated uh, uh, plot uh, that it it filled the whole uh, 45 minutes, and we hadn't finished. The audience laughter was uh, remarkable. So now we had to go off the air with an unfinished show where the actors are all in character. So Gleason Show was so popular in those days that... The Monday edition of papers speculated as to what the ending was and, and what had happened. And Gleason decided he obliged, before we did the next show, to tell the audience uh, the, the denouement. And in doing it, he got so confused himself that what normally is a three or four mi minute monologue took six or seven minutes and the next show ran over. And uh, we decided we wouldn't explain it. <laughs> the plot. Let him work it out. <laughs> uh, 
Um, there was one called uh, Teamwork Beat the Clock. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, um, that was the first show that Sid and I did on our own uh, when we split up. And Marvin and Walter had done the previous show on their own, and it was a beautiful, tender, touching uh, script about their adopting a baby and having to give the baby up. And it was beautiful, and you could feel the audience total immersion and involvement in the show. And here we are, Sid and I are going with a big slapstick show where they're on beat the clock where they have to perform a stunt the stunt being, you've got a, there's a, a lemon machine, and you've got to get a cup and a saucer, run and catch the lemon, and in the in the cup and keep a balloon up in the air, and we figured we're in terrible trouble, uh, and we're very envious of Marvin and Walter to the point where we hate them, uh, permissible among writers, incidentally. Um, uh, now, to further complicate this, Gleason is appearing at the Paramount Theater doing eight shows uh, a week uh, in addition to the, uh, our Saturday night hour show. And the script is sent to him at the Paramount. So now he has time to read. And we had finished it earlier because it was the first time we were alternating. And there's a meeting. He wants to meet with us after his, uh, he wants to meet with us at the Paramount Theater to discuss the script. And he never did that, do you know? And we said to Jack Philbin, the producer, what's up? He says, he's unhappy. Uh, you better come down here now. And I said, I can't. Uh, I had a date to meet a friend from California uh, to see Kismet, and I was meeting her at the theater. Sid had gone uh, to see his doctor, and I didn't know where he was. So I said, we can't come now, which seemed uh, tremendously independent, and film was upset with us, but I said, we can't. Finally arranged to come after 11, close to midnight, when Jackie did the 11 o'clock show, or 10.30, he'd be back in the office at uh, midnight. And I left a message at Sid's home to meet me in the drugstore or the Park Sharon Hotel at 11.15. I went to the theater, met my day, who had flown in that day and wasn't feeling well. And uh, she decided she couldn't stay uh, through Kismet. And I said, I'll take you home. And she said, no, then I won't leave. I'll be fine. I'll get in the, hotel, I'll get in the cab and I'll go home. So I insisted and I put her in the cab. And I go back to Kismet. With all this happening, somehow I liked the play. I couldn't understand. I really enjoyed it. 11 o'clock, I met Sid in the drugstore. We saw everybody else, the wives or the husbands of people who worked on the show there. Gleason had kept everybody. And so I told Sid what had happened, that uh, he was upset with the script, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, we went upstairs where all the writers and the staff had been drinking since 8 o'clock, and there wasn't a sober person in the room. And now Gleason storms in with his, the entourage, and he says, we're going to have to replace the script. He said, it doesn't make any sense. And we said, what's wrong? And this is such a, a devastating defeat because of that marvelous show that Marvin Walter did. And he says, it just doesn't make any sense. And he keeps saying that over and over again. We can't I said, what doesn't make sense? Then we finally, he revealed why none of it made sense to him. In those days in television, the action went on the left side of the page. The dialogue went on the right side of the page, so it was divided. We never had much action. We were in a, uh, the, the uh, kitchen, so uh, he never looked at the left side of the page to know that he had to get a teacup to, to, and, and, uh, and, and catch a lemon and keep a balloon in the air, that he was on a quiz program and he couldn't... Uh, uh, he, you know, all the complications in a plot, all the physical business. So once he read that, he was very chagrined. And, of course, he didn't concern himself with everybody who by then it, it was not physically there but not there. And he said, okay, this stays between us. <laughs> and he went on, did the show, and it played beautifully. Um, so that was the first one that you did with Sidney Lowe? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I uh, just want to mention one other one, the principle of the thing. Do you recall that one? No, I don't. Okay. Um, I also remember want... we named the shows after we did them. Uh -huh. They didn't have names at the time. Number seven, number right. eight, number <laughs> nine. Then somebody said, "Can't do it that way." So we thought up names for them. Now you were mentioning um, the executive producer Jack Philbin. How much contact did you have with him? Uh, Jack Philbin and Jack Hurdle. Jack Hurdle was the equivalent of the online producer, and Jack Philbin was the producer. They were uh, Jackie's emissaries and good friends. Uh, they 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 helped out as much as they could. They were ambassadors, uh, and uh, they uh, represented the writers uh, at times, and they represented Gleason at other times. Hurdle replaced Jackie in the second and third rehearsals. He would then walk the part. Uh, as I said, uh, Jackie would go through it once. Was uh, he good at that? Or? Yeah, he uh, Hurdle uh, captured Jackie's. Uh, spirit and walk and cadence, timing. He, you know, uh, so he was helpful. It worked for Art and Audrey and, and for all the um, uh, supporting players. Jackie eventually narrowed the supporting players down to a handful, ones he could rely on who were never thrown by anything that went wrong. Other actors would panic on stage and they'd say after the first rehearsal uh, they expected him to be there for others and we're starting, he's not coming back. You know, and that uh, uh, would pervade uh, throughout the evening performance, that fear that they weren't well enough rehearsed. Now, I want to get talking about the classic 39, but before I do, on the Variety Show, there was an incident where Gleason broke his leg uh, on the show. I want you to... Yes. Uh, he, he broke his leg uh, <laughs> every once in a while. Uh, as I said, he was generally didn't comment about scripts, uh, but I imagine uh, whenever something didn't work as well as it should have, he probably uh, went into some private incantation. And one day he said, uh, I'll write the, the fourth sketch myself. And we said, we, 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 he said, no, no, I know what to do, and it'll work. I'm going to be in a Buster Brown suit, and I'm going to do a routine on ice skating and so that required dry ice to, get, to give the feeling that he was indeed skating and it was a sketch he wrote we didn't know what it was going to be about or and he walked through it once uh, for camera and that was it and he wasn't on skates at that time and of course showtime he got on skates came out went right on his uh, I don't remember which way he went on his face or his ass but uh, down he went and he broke his leg and so uh, Hot Connie had to extemporize or improvisize uh, the last 15 minutes. He stood out there talking. I was backstage when they were carrying Gleason off on the uh, on the gurney, and he said, "Don't say anything, Leonard." It was those last words as he went out. Did you actually see him falling on camera? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they fall on camera, people rush out to help him. Were Why? Laughing? Yeah? Were well, laughing? first they thought it was funny, then they realized when everybody came out, and then Art Connie came out up front, and they tried to drop the curtain behind Art, and it didn't come all the way down. So they saw, you know, the, the legs running back and forth, and knew there was mayhem behind there, but Art capitalized on it, and did very well. Was he out of the show, Gleason, for a while? Memory tells me yes. Uh, that uh, uh, several weeks. So you just had uh, a variety show with, with uh, guests, mm -hmm. people who volunteered to substitute for him. Would somebody do a monologue? I can't remember whether they did or not. I think it depended on the personality. Uh, and Art did uh, some sketches. Coleman Jacoby and Arnie Rosen usually came to the rescue in situations like that. When we got very worn out or fatigued, they would come in and do a variety show. So I think that gave us an opportunity to catch up on Honeymooners, and they did that series of shows. That's why I'm a little unfamiliar with them. They're not indelibly etched in my memory. Now, so when and why did the Honeymooners become a series? Pop the popularity of it. Uh, as I said, we started doing one about one every five or six weeks. 
and the ratings or the response of people on the street was tremendous. So we started to do them every other week. Uh, and then uh, we, everyone, including Jackie, lost interest in the other characters. They just wanted to do the honeymooners. So we started to do them every week until uh, the fatigue level uh, was uh, uh, at its high. And then Coleman and Ani would come in and do a couple of weeks of, uh, I guess, rescue work, uh, uh, equivalent of uh, uh, respiratory uh, uh, help. Uh, so that they dominated by by public choice. Uh, and I think Gleason had fun doing them as well because, again, the uh, uh, sketches... Are, are different. We, we, the impact of crammed in and ours, and Norton and Trixie were people, and he recognized he was affecting the audience. Remember, Gleason's ratings at that time uh, in numbers. I'm not a great fan of ratings, but let me say that he was 53 percent of the total television audience was watching the show. Uh, there's nothing like that in existence today. Uh, the numbers were like uh, 60, 60 uh, or 60 or 70 share, 53 number. Uh -huh. It was uh, astonishing. And the, sh the show itself was live, remember, it happened. And the audience was 3,000 people filled that theater. You earn your laughs. And it was resounding. It was very ex exhilarating for all of us. It was opening night every week. Um, Fun, fun remembrance. My father is a very gregarious man, and my father and mother would come to every Saturday night uh, uh, shooting of the show, you know, a broadcast. And uh, my father would speak to anyone, and I was always uncomfortable when he did that. He had people on the street, uh, luminaries, and I said, he doesn't know that much. Why is he? What are they talking about? And, uh, it was very disquieting. Well. As I said, he and my mom came to the show every Saturday night. One day, Sid and I are having lunch Saturday. We come back to the theater, we're caught in a tremendous rainstorm. And it, we're drenched. So we figured we'll go in through the front entrance and not have to walk another block and a half to get into the stage entrance. So we knock on the door, and an usher inside looks up, and we say, open the door, writers of the show. He, he, so we project a little more. Right is the show, raining. We don't want to go in the stage door. Open the door. He says, no, go to the stage entrance. And we're getting a right is the show. And that time the head usher comes up and we hear him say, that's okay. That's Mr. Stern's son. I got in on my father's cognizance. Been writing the show for three years. Um, uh, we're at the end of this time. Okay. So good enough.